morning, everyone. We have lift off. It's absolutely 9.30 to start the, the meeting. Can I just welcome everyone to the fourth meeting of the Social Security Committee? Uh, I can remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones uh, or turn to silent as they do basically interfere with the sound system. I could also ask when people are speaking into the mic if they stay about a foot away. It turned out it was very good last last uh, uh, term. Uh, basically, the sound was much better in that respect. Uh, we now turn to agenda item one. No apologies have been received. And agenda item one is decision on taking items th in private, three and four in private. Uh, if we take these in private, item three allows us to reflect on the evidence taken at last week's meeting and at today's meeting. And item four is to enable us to discuss uh, our work programme and our priorities. And uh, I think we should agree to review in private future evidence taken at the round table sessions. So I wonder if everyone in the committee is agreeable to that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item two is a work programme priorities. Uh, it's an evidence session uh, in a round table format. Uh, our aim is to gather as much evidence as possible to inform uh, this committee and focus our priorities uh, for the medium and longer term uh, aspects and sessions of the Parliament. Uh, round table format really should allow us to keep the discussion flowing quite freely and uh, if anyone wishes to speak, could you please perhaps speak through me, catch my eye or the clerk's eye and ensure that everyone gets an opportunity to contribute to uh, the session as well. Um, could keep the discussion moving fairly fluidly and that's much better for everyone to be able to get as much information as possible. Can I just welcome our witnesses here today and if the witnesses would like to say basically who, who they are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Isla McIntosh from Glasgow Disability Alliance. Thank you. Um, James Adams from RNIB Scotland. Um, Craig Wilson from the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. Leila Tyner from Disability Agenda Scotland, we're a coalition of leading disability charities in Scotland. Uh, Bill Scott from Inclusion Scotland. Craig Kelly from Poverty Alliance. I'm John McCallion from the Scottish Pensioners Forum. Thank you all much, very much for coming in today and looking forward to your contributions. Uh, I also want to thank everyone for the written submissions that they've supplied also. If I could just start off the discussion by throwing in a general question and people can come in after that to raise any issues that they want or any comments that they may have. You know, the Scottish Government plans to bring forward a Social Security uh, Bill. We also understand the Scottish Government plans to bring forward a Child Poverty Bill. Uh, something obviously this committee will be looking at and will be very interested in also. In light of this, what would you see being the key priorities of this committee? Whoever wants to start. As you'll see from the written evidence that we've submitted, um, we um, reflect in the views of um, sort of over 3,000 members that we've got, it was hard to kind of identify uh, a, a narrow list of priorities, but um, uh, the things that came through from um, the conference that we had recently from our membership was that um, the system, the social security system, the values and the um, principles that have been expressed um, so far are very warmly welcomed by disabled people and the, the ongoing engagement of disabled people in designing a, a fairer system and, um, and helping to implement those values um, will be very warmly welcomed as well um, uh, and in a, in a system that would, that would fit with um, other components that um, disabled people particularly rely on, such as social care, um, housing, employment and, um, and lifelong learning as well. That, that, that social security is, is part of a, whole, a wider framework that could help to achieve that vision. Okay. John, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, everyone I would think there's, uh, there's a kind of number of key priorities, but first of all, there's the transition from these benefits coming from the Department of Work and Pensions to the, the Scottish Social Security Agency. No benefit claimant should suffer any uh, deterioration in their situation and get the transition right has to be one of the big priorities if others be concerned here. Second one, I think, is to make funeral poverty uh, one of the priorities uh, for this for this committee because it is a real issue that affects thousands of people across Scotland. It is forcing poor, poor people into debt 
And the third one, I would say, is that the one universal benefit which has been transformed, uh, transferred from the Department of Work and Pensions, the, the Winter Fuel Alliance, should remain a universal benefit. And that's a very important priority for the pensioners' movement. Yeah, thank you very much. Peter, I think you're next. And then Bill, your hand up. I think the, the thanks, convener. I think the way that you um, uh, highlighted the connection between the child poverty bill and the social security bill is really important. Um, and I guess it's, it's towards the end of the, the short paper that we put in um, that we submitted. I think a, a, a key task or a key challenge for the committee is to think about our new powers and and our existing powers and how we use those to address poverty. Um, Social Security can't end poverty on its own, can't tackle poverty on its own, but it can make a significant contribution. So I think it's important to consider um, uh, the, the scrutiny of the Social Security legislation as it goes through um, here, this committee, in that context, and also your, your um, reflections and scrutiny of the, the Child Poverty Bill. Um, and I, I would echo some of the things that, that John has just said, um, particularly around fu funeral poverty and what Isla said around engaging with um, direct users of, of all of these services, I think is critically important for the, the committee to continue to do. We had a, a session with our members yesterday and the issue of funeral poverty came through very clearly on that. We'll be uh, producing a report on that in due course. Thank you very much. I think Bill came in and then it was... James. Thanks very much, uh, convener. Um, I think I'm going to echo some of what's already been said, but we, we said in our own submission that you know, we should be exploring the opportunities presented by these new powers to try and align policies and services. And the child poverty um, bill and the social security bill, if we could think of them coming together because According to the New Policy Institute, 48% of all those living in poverty are either disabled people or people living with disabled people. For children, 40% of disabled children live in poverty and 44% of the children of disabled adults live in poverty. So if you fail to address the problems of, faced by either the children of disabled parents or disabled children themselves, you're not going to solve child poverty and you're not going to half it. So you, you need to think in terms of all of the, the policies being aligned so that you achieve your aims and ends that, you, that you're working towards for 2030. Thank, thank you very much. Is James, do you want to come in and then Craig? Um, there's a few areas which I'll quickly touch on. One's a general principle, which um, John McCallion sort of mentioned, which is that through this devolution of um, power through the Scottish Parliament, it's important that um, groups collectively and individuals aren't detrimented by that devolution. So, um, for instance, we have to make sure that all the current groups that receive a certain level of benefit or access to um, employment from the current system don't end up having a worse, worse deal. That also goes to individuals. There are some individuals that will have migrated from DLA to PIP already. So any alterations or changes there, we have to try and make sure they're not financially disadvantaged by that. Um, a couple of specific areas for a blind part cited include accessibility. There's a natural move to more online government and uh, there's a whole range of benefits. Some currently, I think Universal Credit is fully, you apply for it online, others are by phone, others are by paper. It needs to be, it'd be good to have some sort of consolidation of that, but also for blind part cited folk, quite clearly having online applications is a barrier. So we would just urge the committee to look at how you'd have accessible application for all different groups. Also uh, through assessments, um, there are some conditions which medically aren't going to improve or be cured or be reversed. So why some would have to go through repeat assessments when they've already been medically told they're blind and that's not going to change. It just puts them through undue stress um, and also creates work for the departments who are having to look at it. So we try and look to try and find some way of removing that element from any process. Um, also, access to technology. Uh, technology is one of these areas which um, is a wonderful opportunity for, for disadvantaged groups to try and get out to level playing field. But obviously, the speed of technology means there's a risk people can fall behind quite quickly. And the cost of technology for people with sight loss is extraordinary. Some of the costs, like a braille reader or a note taker, 
going to into many thousands of pounds. So we would hope that any new um, welfare service could look at the cost of technology for disadvantaged groups to allow them to access employment opportunities, perhaps apply for benefits and perhaps live sort of um, normal lives. And the final thing I'll just mention is the role of advice. Uh, there's so many, uh, it's a wide, varied, um, diverse population out there. And it's really important that we get specialist advice on top of the general advice services that perhaps local authorities might offer. There's been large cuts to local authorities, um, as we know, I think it's 11% over the last five years. So that means one of the areas which are um, underfunded, arguably, are advice services. So we look to see if there's some way of uh, central government, perhaps working with the third sector, with ACVO or whoever, to try and resource some, some sort of advice services which people could access in order to maximise their incomes and opportunities in the benefit system. Thank you very much. Craig, you want to Yes, so um, SCBO obviously represent um, many third sector organisations. So um, instead of looking at specific policy details, we are trying to look at maybe the broader principles that might inform a system that would work uh, well and achieve the, the outcomes that, that people want to see. So we've split that down into sort of four key areas that, that we think the committee should um, perhaps focus their attention. Um, the first would be to continue to engage with third sector organisations who um, have the expertise and the networks that would be valuable to the, the committee in terms of um, looking at certain areas, more specific areas, um, and also as a sort of conduit to the people who use the services as well in a more informal manner. So continuing to engage with third sector is you know, crucial. Um, Linking employment with social security is another area that um, is very important. Mm -hmm. um, many, pe many people that receive benefits and uh, are involved with the social security committee also work, uh, sorry, not the committee, <laughs> involved with the social security system um, also work. And I think we have to be mindful of that in terms of how they can engage with the system uh, and also to aid the transition from um, social security to work and back. Um, and making sure that that's as swift and easy as possible for people. Um, learning from the past is obviously very important. The DWP is a well-established department and it's full of people who have very great ideas and have experienced the system for a long time, so it's important to continue to engage with them. Um, but for us, um, adopting a human rights-based approach is very important. Um, there are rights that exist for people that are out there already, and with those if those are kept in mind and those are pursued at all times, then the sort of system that I think everyone wants to see can, can be realised. Yeah, thank you very much. Leila, you wanted to come in and I'll introduce Marion. Who's... Leila. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few points, and some of that is obviously going to echo what people have already said before, but just to pull out a few key things for us was firstly, I mean, this is an opportunity with the Social Security Bill coming through to address some of the concerns that people have had about existing benefits but I think just to echo what John was saying um, and also James around taking time to get some of this right because I think there is concern certainly when we've talked to people who are on benefits disabled people but also welfare rights um, advisors um, who are working within the system that we don't want to have anybody having no debt we don't want to have detriment to people with existing benefits but also it's a complicated system and it's unlikely to become much more simplified so if we're going to make changes ideally we just want to think those through and give people time to work with them and as bill was saying around poverty there are undeniably higher levels of poverty amongst disabled people and some of that's actually to do with the additional costs of being disabled so there's some really good research that highlights that people on average have additional costs of 550 pounds a month so in terms of thinking about what the role of social Social security should be in terms of helping those people uh, either outside of poverty or living an independent life. It would be worth just considering some of that. Um, and then thirdly, around the system itself, um, going back to some of the things that James was saying around assessments. So could there be longer awards, possibly even um, greater automaticity for certain conditions? We'd really need to think that through and how that works, but it would potentially save some resourcing of the assessments that's being put through. And also um, some of the turmoil that, and stress that people face going through the current assessments. Um, and then lastly, um, highlighting employment. So for disabled people, the employment rate in Scotland at the moment is 44%, which is much lower than 73% that it is for the general population. And some of those people can't work, but actually there's barriers that for people who do want to work and be in work, and then also for people who 
are able to get a job, how they move in and out of social security so that it's not impeding them. Thank you very much, Leila. Can I just welcome Marion Davis from the One Parent Family Scotland? Hi. Welcome, Marion. Uh, would you like to put any contribution in, in regards to what you feel this, this committee could do to look at what should be our priorities as we're going through the Social Security Bill and obviously the Child Poverty Bill as well? Um, yes, uh, we uh, were very pleased to be invited today because um, we do think the social security system is badly in need of reform. And the fact that some of the powers are coming to Scotland um, gives us an opportunity to, to treat people with dignity and respect and to support uh, everyone to achieve their potential. Um, we think it's particularly important to look at the new social security agency and the model of delivery and how that would uh, roll out. Um, and to ensure you know, that that's uh, administered at a national level and we have national sort of standards for, for that delivery model. Um, we feel particularly that single parents have been very negatively affected by welfare reform in general. Um, and it's predicted that single parents uh, well, and their children um, are going to become ever poorer by 2020. So we felt it was important for the committee to look at um, the impact on family wellbeing of any new powers that, that we have. Um, children's rights um, and uh, we do we take a human rights approach to, to the benefit system. Um, so that's about protecting the income of children and families and using new powers uh, to, to top up to tackle that link with, with child poverty. Um, we also sort of think social security in the wider sense um, has to fit into the jigsaw of other policies and in particular around employability. Um, we're very concerned about government plans for um, parents with children who are three and four uh, to be required to move into work um, and uh, we think that's of relevance to employability programmes and some of which is coming to Scotland as well and the link um, I mentioned in our paper um, with sanctions and the infrastructure in Scotland uh, of childcare so there's a lot of, uh, kind of interconnected sort of policies that we think the committee um, could make sure that there's a kind of link in with, with, with these. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Marion. Uh, any of the committee, any questions that they wish to ask the witnesses or any comments that you want to make at this moment? Adam. Um, th thank you very much, everyone. Adam Tompkins. Um, uh, I, I had three questions that are unrelated to each other. I, mean, I don't know if you want me to just take, take one of them and then uh, I'll come back, uh, come back yes, in a little while. Perhaps I could start with um, something that struck me very forci forci forcibly, forcefully in Peter Kelly's written evidence, um, uh, which, was, uh, which was very helpful, where he says that there are limits uh, on the extent to which the social security system can address poverty. Um, and this um, struck me as being... Um, in um, accord with, rather than in discord with, um, some of the remarks made in the Joseph Rowntree um, uh, recently published uh, pretty comprehensive strategy on how to, sol how to solve poverty in the UK, which I'm sure everybody in the room has been uh, reading and studying, where um, I think uh, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation say that uh, the strategy that we've used for so many years um, of um, increasing uh, social security payments as a principal means of addressing poverty has failed. I think I can't find the exact quote, but it's something something of, of those um, something to that extent. So the first question to Peter is: do you, Would you could you could you react to uh, give us your sense of what the Joseph Rowntree Foundation are saying in this in this really quite striking report? Um, and, and secondly, could you expand a little bit on what you said in your written evidence about uh, there being limits to the extent to which social security system can ad can address poverty? Sure. Um, I think on, on the uh, Joseph Rowntree Foundation report, I have to confess that probably like many other people, I'm working my way through the full report, which is uh, a pretty weighty tome. But yeah, it's, uh, we contributed to, to some of the, the evidence that they gathered around that, uh, producing that strategy, and it is very helpful. I think to, to go on about what, um, to go further about uh, our, our statement about the, the, the limits to the social security system, I think uh, John Dickey from, um, from CPAG has, has often talked about the social security system having to do too much of the heavy lifting in terms of tackling poverty. Um, that, that we understand that there are other source, there are other reasons why people are in poverty. It's, um, uh, it's their inability to, to be in work or it's when they're in work, it's um, low pay. So, so there are limits on 
the extent to which our social security system can solve the problem of poverty. However, I think there, there are real questions about um, the way that our social security system has almost retreated from, from taking on that role of, of seeing quite clearly that it has a role to play in tackling poverty. So for many years now, I think um, we have um, developed a, a UK-wide social security system who I think its main uh, um, reason for being has been to encourage people to move into the labour market. Um, and, and, and many of our programmes, particularly um, our, our core um, benefits, if you like, so things like employment support allowance, um, job seekers allowance, have over a very long period of time, this isn't something that's happened in the last five years, 10 years, or even 20 years, this has been a long-term trend where the emphasis in, in our social security system is to move people into work. Now, that's, that's fine, it has that role too, but I think what we've, um, what we've paid less attention to is the role that our social security system can play in alleviating poverty and helping to lift people out of poverty. Now, obviously, we're, we're getting a, a limited range of powers in Scotland some really important ones, and when I say limited, uh, that's not to diminish their importance, particularly around uh, disability benefits. But I think as we develop our system, one of the things we have to think about is how we use that to, to address poverty within those limits, but how we use it. One of the things that's absent from the consultation paper, which came out at our members' meeting, which many of them identified, um, is that the issue of adequacy um, of, of those benefits that we will have delivered to Scotland isn't mentioned. So there's some discussion about uprating, which is useful, that's good. Um, but how do we move towards a system where uh, we can say that the, the benefits that are being delivered in Scotland are contributing towards an adequate income? Sorry, very long answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gordon, you wanted to give in? Sorry. Um, thank, you, thank you, convener. I just want to follow in on some of the remarks, uh, I think touched on by a number, but um, in particular by Craig Wilson, about a, a rights-based approach. And I was just wondering if, the, from a language point of view, responsibility doesn't also come into that, because of course no one can have rights unless someone has a responsibility in respect of those rights. And from a language point of view, the voluntary sector, for example, it's not so much in the sense of a legal right or entitlement as it may be in respect of uh, benefits from a, a government department. And talking about responsibilities, would you agree that that's important because it goes beyond um, simple legal responsibilities, but also as a society we have a responsibility as individuals for each other and that brings in the, the voluntary sector and others who do things not necessarily because they're legally required to, but out of a sense of responsibility towards each other, and indeed in respect of the social security system itself, if the concept of responsibility is brought into the language, it can also help improve the attitude towards those who um, seek to rely on the system when they need to. I would say it was fair that in any contract there are rights and responsibilities on both parties, but um, approaching it from the, the angle that the state has certain responsibilities under um, you know, international conventions that it has, has signed up to basic standards of living for people, um, you know, these rights are inherent, and if the system itself is not able to deliver those, then that's obviously a challenge, um, but the human rights based approach is more a guiding principle towards creating a system that, that works well and fulfills the, the things that I think people want to see in terms of dignity and respect. And um, It's more of a, a, a framework, um, and I can point some of the members to, to that framework. The United Nations uh, Research Institute for Social Development have done a, a lot of work on this and have tried to break it down, because it is quite a, a kind of lofty concept, but it does have, you know, the, the principles behind it are, are good um, and, and it, it can lead to a system that, that provides the, the best results for people. Um, I think there, there obviously has to be um, an element of responsibility 
involved, um, but I think the vast majority of people enter into the social security system because they have to, and they go into it with the best intentions and, and don't necessarily wish to be there. And I think if the system that's in place um, is working for them, then hopefully they won't be there as long as they would otherwise have to be. See if, it, if, if anyone wants to come in on a specific, even though a question is to a specific person, others who will have an interest. And I think, Bill, you wanted to come in on that particular one. And Mary, did you want to come up in that one? Yeah. yeah. Um, um, the issue is that human rights are absolute. Um, it is the state which has responsibility. Um, and most of the benefits that we're talking about in terms of disability and carers' benefits place no conditions on the individual to seek work or anything like that. that those are uh, employment support allowance and job seekers allowance, which are entirely other benefits that have been reta retained by the UK government. Um, the UK government is a signatory to the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled People, and that convention and one of its articles says that everyone who is a disabled person has a right to an adequate income to meet the basic needs that arise. Now, we do not deny human rights to serial killers or child murderers uh, who are incarcerated in our prisons. We do not say to them, you do not eat, you do not feed, uh, you do not get heat, you do not get light, uh, you do not get a roof over your head. And yet we are denying those basic rights to some of our most vulnerable citizens who are dying as a consequence of cuts to their benefits. Um, it's not me saying that, it's the Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland, which has found that people are committing suicide because they have lost the benefits through the work capability assessment. Now, you know, as a civilised society and as a signatory to those human rights conventions, it's us that have the responsibilities towards those people. And we should not be denying that by saying that they, we place responsibilities on them. I, I'd also like just briefly to address Adam's point because I do think we, we need to address the employability gap between disabled people and, and non-disabled people. It's even larger if you look at non-disabled people's uh, employment rates at, rather than the general populations, because it's over 80% now in Scotland for non-disabled people, 44% for disabled people. We need to think how, again, we use the new powers that we're getting to try and maximise people's chances of securing employment who want to work. And uh, you um, and that means not denying them basic benefits that help them do that. The problem is, as things are continuing, 47, 48% of those on higher rate mobility are losing that entitlement as they move across from disability living allowance to personal independence payment. One in three of those people use the, their higher rate mobility to lease a mobility vehicle. And one in three of those people use that mobility vehicle to get to and from work. Without that mobility vehicle, they lose the means to get into their, their job and you are placing their employment in jeopardy. That is why a social security system should be designed to support people to achieve their full potential, rather than punishing them for being born with an impairment or acquiring an impairment later in life. That's why we, you know, we would ask this committee, when they're looking at the bills that are coming before it, to think how it can maximise the potential of the Scottish population and see Social Security as an investment in the people that you're making the payments to so that they can live full and active lives, which is what they want to do. Thank you, Bill. <coughs> Marion, you wanted to come in? Um, yeah, happily, I've read the GIRF report on the train on the way here. So. <laughs> um, what it does say is that um, in the UK, there's 13.5 million people in poverty, and of those, 35% um, uh, of children are in poverty. So not just that, but we're moving towards a trend where by 2020 that's going to increase. And as you say, it's not just the benefit system. They point out that it's low wages, it's insecure jobs, and it's unemployment, um, and it's lack of skills. Um, but what they do say is that one of the key issues is an ineffective benefit system, errors, delays, that comes ac uh, a across a lot in the advice that we give, give to people. It's confusing, it's hard to engage with, people aren't treated with respect. Um, and as Peter said, the level of benefits, um, especially in work benefit, 
caused a high percentage of children in poverty actually live with a parent who's in work. Um, for people seeking work and uh, as Bill has pointed out people who can't work because of health and disability the levels um, are not acceptable um, so I think when we look at the bits that we are going to gain and that are going to be devolved we want to avoid and steer clear of um, the mistakes that are made in the Westminster system uh, and an opportunity to use a rights-based approach where yes the state does have a responsibility to ensure that there isn't an explosion of food banks, of which I think there's around about 50, 50 or 60 in Glasgow. Um, and when you ask people why that is, one of the main reasons is because of the benefit system. And so uh, I think, aside from the, the parts we're having brought to us in Scotland, um, I think it'd be useful if the committee did keep an eye on exactly what is still with Westminster and what is happening, what's impacting on um, children in Scotland as well, that there's going to be such massive increases in child poverty, no matter what we can do, um, that uh, we, we need to put pressure on Westminster as well to reverse some of the cuts to universal credit and some of the, the changes that they're about to implement um, for, you know, th I know it came up at the last meeting, um, benefits just for two children, uh, the benefit cap and that kind of thing. I think we still need to be feeding back our experiences locally uh, to Westminster about the hardship all of these things are, are causing. Uh, thank you very much. John, you wanted to come in on that yeah. short point there? I, mean, I think everyone would agree that there, is a, there has to be a balance between uh, rights and responsibilities. And the role of the voluntary sector is obviously critical. Uh, to provide you know, the proper social security debt in this country. But I think we have to be careful about the balance between volunteering and uh, people being paid to look after or, or, uh, or to provide work. The integrated health boards, which are just starting up in Scotland across the country to provide health and social care for older people uh, as well as others, uh, are virtually telling us that they are facing unprecedented levels of cuts in their spending. Now, the the temptation is for local authorities and other public sector uh, bodies to cut down in the amount of paid work which covers these people and to use unpaid volunteers to take their place. And that would be a major error, I think, in the part of any social security system. Volunteers are wonderful, they do a wonderful job, but they mustn't take the place of properly qualified, properly paid uh, health, care, uh, health care assistants, social workers and so on. And I think there's a danger that we're eroding the public sector and pushing unpaid volunteerism into its place. And that's taking us back the way it's not taking us forward. <clears throat> Alison, you wanted to come in and then... Yeah. Lady, you wanted to come in and then... Probably particularly to Peter and Bill. Um, we've discussed a lot in this committee already the need to have a social security system that's based on the principles of dignity and respect now obviously that isn't all about money i mean i think you know um reducing repeat assessments would be a big step towards that uh, perhaps james can can tell us how often someone who is blind you know recovers their sight so clearly there is a massive need to reduce assessments which which are obviously costly time consuming um, and so on so I think while we're discussing dignity and respect you know Peter made the point we can't have digni dignity and respect without adequate cash you know let, let's be serious and the Poverty Alliance raised the issue of top-up powers and new benefits in their submission and I think um, you felt that they haven't been much discussed yet and I suppose uh, uh, you know Bill you were making the point too I mean people in Scotland are already suffering from this transfer from DLA to PIP. So what new powers and top-up benefits would you like us to look at? <laughs> Alison, I think some people are still want to come in basically on, on other issues. Uh, we have, have a list of people still waiting, so if you don't mind, we'll come back to that particular one, because I think it's a, it's a new area, and, and absolutely. Pauline, you wanted to come in. Was, I'm very interested in the answer to that because um, I, I think there's there's so much to consider here. So I, I'm just going to try and get kind of home in that kind of area. But, but uh, so it seems to me. So the first question I have is um, was it the just to get this right the the disability agenda Scotland right. Um, so, you, so you're suggesting that there should be greater automaticity in the, in the system and that some people should have their benefits for life and that kind of thing. So I, I think we need to have a bit more information about so what 
percentage of people. Who would that apply to? Because it wouldn't apply to everyone. See, what, what I'm really interested in is to get to the stage where we're going to have to think about the design of this system pretty soon, actually, <laughs> to boil all this information down. So it seems to me that there's policy questions which I suppose Alison's really asking about, which I'm interested to know the answer to. But then there's questions about what do you think, how then do we actually design then a system which has got less assessments, which has sort of automatic entitlement, um, reduces the errors in the system and reduces delay. So it seems to me, let's just throw this open, that, that, that can really only be achieved if there's some level of prescription in the Social Security Bill itself, which we haven't seen. So I'm just interested to know if, if anyone's given consideration then to, to then how does the legislation uh, then reflect what we're trying to achieve here, whether it's a system that's a, whatever you want to achieve, whether it's a rights-based approach or have more automatic entitlement. Do you think there has to be a high level of prescription in, in the bill to achieve that? That's a very good point. Rounds up a lot of the, the various issues. Could I bring in uh, two more and then we could, you know, direct the question to um, Isla, I called you Leila, sorry. Isla, you wanted to come in and then Ruth wanted to come in and then we can... Thanks, Convener. Um, yeah, I wanted to um, underline, actually, Bill and uh, Peter's responses to a couple of the earlier questions around um, how the social security system is limited in tackling poverty on, in and of itself, um, because that's definitely um, uh, underlined by experiences our members have shared with us um, around, particularly as Bill underlined, the, um, the, the levels of poverty that disabled people face and the percentage of people in poverty who are either disabled or in a household with a disabled person um, is, is very, very high. And a lot of the other barriers that disabled people face contribute to that, which is a, a, a key reason why um, we would like to urge the, um, the committee to ensure that the Social Security Bill uh, complements and, and works well with other powers existing and new, particularly around the employability support powers that are, are, are also come into Scotland, albeit with a very reduced budget. Um, the, um, as it stands, employment support services um, for disabled people at the moment um, through the job centre are, are not always specialised. There's, there's been a, a real move away from um, disability employment advisors having to have any kind of specialist um, insight or um, qualification in that area. And actually the, the people who are, um, who are um, eligible and targeted by those services are the people who are closest to the labour market already um, and at, at Glasgow Disability Alliance who we support through our employability which um, is, is, is non, not statutory funded um, is, is people who have a, a wide variety of other skills and contributions to make which I think links well with what actually Gordon had asked about around um, the language of responsibility because um, as Bill said there's been a real move towards that meaning um, it being limited to paid employment and for a lot of disabled people um, disabled people are much less likely to leave school with qualifications um, there are um, there are attitudinal barriers and access barriers that stop qualified disabled people from getting the jobs that they are, are very capable of doing. Um, and the social security system currently puts barriers in, in the way of people being able to gain experience through volunteering without that impacting on their benefits as well. Um, but um, the language that's been proposed at the moment around supporting um, people to fulfil their potential and to participate in society, that's language that we would we really strongly um, support, um, rather than specifically responsibility, which um, when, when couched to, towards the individual in terms of social security has become um, stigmatized in, in, in the, the, a lot of the attitudes that we see in the media are, are following a lot of Westminster reforms that, um, that, that suggest that people who are claiming benefits are irresponsible, <laughs> um, whereas actually, a system which supports people to participate and make a whole range of contributions, whether it's in their families, communities, volunteering, um, uh, or, or or paid employment. Um, uh, that that's a system which can um, 
can build a, a much stronger community across Scotland and, and make best use of actually the resources that disabled people have to contribute, um, disabled people and, and others as well. Thank you. Uh, Ruth wanted to come in. Yeah, yep, thank you, convener. Um, Bill um, from Inclusion Scotland, isn't it? Yeah, Inclusion Scotland. In the written um, submission, speaks about the impact of the loss of uh, motability vehicles and you touched on it there and certainly in um, my constituency and my surgery I've seen firsthand uh, the I, I mean there's no other word for it the utter distress that, that a loss of, of, of these vehicles have um, caused so I think I'd just like to hear a little bit more from other folk around the table about that s sort of specific point about Take, how taking away these things actually impedes people's um, ability to, um, you know, take part in society, essentially, and, as you say, volunteer or, or move to employment, if that's something that would, that would suit them. Okay. Uh, James, would you want to come in? Thank you. Just following on from Gordon's um, comment about the rights and responsibilities, about three in four blind and part sight people of working age are not in work. And that's a consistent figure that's, you know, in economic times that are good or bad, there's a very high level of unemployment rates amongst blind and sighted people. And some of the social security benefits are actually there to enhance their opportunity to be included in society, to be part of their community, to be able to get out and about. So it's, it's, it's much more than just an employment sort of um, opportunity. So we just, we just sort of, you know, what is the cost of somebody having a reasonable opportunity to be included in society? I think that's something which it's very hard to put a figure on that because obviously it, different conditions, conditions have got different needs. But that's something which I think should be um, sort of thought through by a committee. And just on Pauline's comments about the automaticity, autoticity, um, it is very difficult to try and be prescriptive about what particular conditions are going to be permanent. We've got advanced medical technology. Things do change very rapidly. Perhaps there are some cases where people can have uh, improvements in their condition, but perhaps there could be some evidence brought to committee by from a medical side. You know, there will be people who can work out professionally medically what conditions ain't going to be changing anytime soon, and perhaps those could be where the prescriptive list might be if you want to go down that route. So it might not be in the legislation you would put it, perhaps you could have some body where that would be considered on a biannual or, I don't know, however, in a regular t time period to allow that to be sort of um, monitored. Because it is, you know, it wouldn't be reasonable to give somebody automatic entitled benefits when, you know, they actually are able to, you know, participate because that condition has had some kind of treatment which actually has improved them. So it does need to be looked at, but Undoubtedly, there is a need for some level of automatic entitlement. Thank you. Uh, Leila, you wanted to come in then, George. So I was just going to come in, actually, back to Pauline's question and comment and just basically what James was saying there. I think what we were, in our written submission, had put in about automaticity is it's not going to cover everything, um, but it could be a way, and I would say could. It, it needs for a look at, for, to be looked at further, but it seemed to be one thing that had come up that there could possibly be a list for some conditions, and that wouldn't cover everyone from disability benefits, but it would save some assessments and also where the people do meet certain conditions that they they move through the system a bit quicker and i think it's come up already for instance certain types of sight loss but other conditions are very unlikely short of medical breakthroughs or te technological breakthroughs they're not likely to change so there could be some responsibility on on the onus on the individual should their condition change that they report back and that can be looked at again. I mean, it could be that it worsens, for instance, and that they report back on that. But that's why we, we're, we're driving at an automaticity, that it would be a tranche of some people who are looking at disability benefits, that this might fit for them. And then there would probably be a catch-all of looking at assessments for other people is the thinking on that. And we can, we, we can share more as we look at that in more detail. And I think, as James was saying, maybe potentially looking at that from other people as well to consider how that might work in practice. Thank you. George, you wanted to come in? Yes, it was uh, basically, I was going to ask on the fact that I've been, it's been quite interesting. We get these new powers, we've got everybody automatically wants to see, well, we'll use them. You know, we'll find a way to make life better for the individuals involved. But I've been really quite impressed with some of the evidence that I've been receiving both last week and this week from the fact that a lot of the groups are saying that, uh, but we need to get this right. 
don't go rushing in. Now, uh, I personally think that's probably the way to do, because we only need to look at the devastation caused by the system by Westminster currently to see that we need to get this right. And only having 15 per cent of the actual uh, social security powers shows that, you know, we've, we've got a vulnerable group of individuals here that we've got to work with and we've got to make sure that we protect them and get it right. But I'm interested uh, with the fact that in the evidence that we've got written evidence, the Disability Agenda Scotland, that you actually say that uh, improvements need to be made and be in a well managed, taking the time to get it right. And also I'd be interested in hear what uh, Glasgow Disability Alliance have to say, because you had a round table with 38 members, or 38 round tables, and uh, some of the evidence that came back was, again, it was uh, the Scottish Government needs to end the degrading DWP approach to assessment, but you also said that ongoing involvement and investment in disabled people in DPO working in co-production, and I think, is this not the way we should be going forward? It should be, unlike previous times, we should be working with the groups around these tables to try and create what do you need what, how can we make it better, as opposed to saying, well, that's the rules, you just, uh, you just deal with that, you know, it's, I don't know, it's quite a broad scale there, but if anyone can just give me some ideas. Okay, well, well Bill, Bill wants to come in and his name, and then Isla. Very much in response to that, you know, in our own submission we say that I think we need to go further than engagement. Engagement's good, but it's generally asking people, you know, general principles, what should we do? We, the people that use the system know it intimately because they're subjected to it you know, regularly. And we should be involved in them in the planning and decision making about the new system. And that actually means disabled people at the table with civil servants, etc., and on the new Disability Benefits Commission that's being established because disabled people should be having a say in, in how that benefit uh, is structured and delivered. Uh, because, again, you can only test it in delivery once it's there. And I, I totally agree with you. We have to get it right. But even with the best will in the world, we will not get 100% right. And we will need to tweak it as, as we go along. And that's why I think a Disability Benefits Commission could be really, really useful in doing that. It was also asked about what the loss of mobility um, might involve. And I think it's not well understood outside the health professionals um, who look at health inequalities, but social isolation kills people quicker than cancer or heart disease. And you're depriving somebody not only the means to get to work, but the means to have contact with friends and family, with a local community, etc. It's just devastating. And it isolates them in their homes. It makes them prisoners there. And we, we need to think through what the costs are of that, because we look at benefit as a cost, but we don't look at the costs to the health and social care system that arise out of people becoming ill, mentally ill, and yet physical conditions we know become worse if people are not active. So, your know, chronic conditions, etc. On, uh, on longer awards, I think we need to, to move towards that for people with lifetime conditions. Uh, the Health Impact Delivery Group NHS Scotland and Scottish Government established it. It consulted with GPs, OTs, physiotherapists, psychiatrists, addiction workers, public health practitioners, etc. And they said they're not being asked for medical evidence by ATOS or Maxima or CAPTA. They're not being asked for it. <laughs> um, and therefore, decisions are being made without the people with the knowledge of how the conditions affect uh, the disabled people that are treating, being asked for the, the medical evidence. And what we should do, I think, as GDA have argued, is move towards a single benefit across the course of the lifetime, because that would make it much less complicated. We currently have DLA for children under 16. We have personal independence payment between 16 and 65, and attendance allowance for over 65s. Three benefits three benefits to administer, three benefits with totally different entitlement criteria. You know, how complex could we make it? You know, if, we were start, if we are starting from scratch, one benefit, much, much less assessments. The old DLA, 70% of the assessments were carried out paper assessments, not face-to-face. -face. Under personal independence payment, 95% of assessments, face-to-face -face assessments that cost three and a half times as much 
as the old assessment system. So we're using money to pay for assessments that could be going towards supporting disabled people. So, you know, there are things you can do within the existing budget to improve the, the benefit that's there. Um, and, and, and answer a question before it's asked, less than 1% of um, disability benefit claims for the ELA and PIP are found to be fraudulent or overpayments arising from error. That's the lowest within the social security system, lowest fraud rate. That we, we're treating 99% of people who have done nothing wrong and are legit, making legitimate claims as though they were fraudsters. And that, that robs them of their dignity and, and respect. Again, we can address that in any new system. And I, I think we need, we need to begin to ask the right people the right questions. And it's not always GPs. It's sometimes an OT that's carrying out a care assessment. It will sometimes be some, a, a, a psychiatrist or physiotherapist that's working more closely with a person that can tell you exactly how that condition affects them. But certainly more lifetime awards or certainly much longer awards than we currently have. One um, GP um, said that they had been phone called by a PIP assessor and asked about um, manual dexterity. And he had to point out that as the person was a quadruple or amputee, they were not going to regain the use of their hands. <laughs> I mean, nobody should be seeking uh, medical advice like that uh, to support a claim. They should have taken the claimant's word. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you very much, Bill. Peter, would you come in? Yeah. Um, I'm going to try and uh, go back to some of the points that, that Alison and Pauline raised earlier. Um, and I think going back to it, it was about dignity and respect and how do you achieve that in the system and what are some of the, the elements you need to put in place um, to achieve that and, and it maybe picks up on some of the other points as well. I think the use of top-up powers, so I think you started from you know, how do you achieve that adequacy. Um, I know at the last session uh, the issue of topping up child benefit was raised and I imagine that will be raised many times in the future as well. We would certainly be supportive of that. Um, it's clearly expensive, but again, it goes it goes back to the the question that Adam Tompkins asked at the start about the role of the the system and the use of the new powers. You know, how do we use them to address poverty as well as securing dignity and respect? And and we think that that is one way, and um, that we could have a significant impact on uh, poverty reduction in Scotland by by making use of of uh, those new powers in respect to uh, child benefit. I think we do need to also look creatively about how we how we use uh, powers f in other areas as well. And, and we we're just at the start of doing this work. And I think again, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation uh, materials points to some areas where we might have to um, uh, focus our thoughts. So Bill has has discussed uh, in some detail the the fact that disabled people are at significant risk of poverty. I think we also need to think about um, adults, a lot of our attention is, is focused on families, quite rightly, but uh, single adults are a growing part of the population. Um, we also need to think about um, uh, the type of housing tenure that people are, are living in. So we know that people living in the private rented sector are, are more likely to be in poverty now than, than they might have been in the past. These are all things that as we develop our our policies and as we develop our social security powers, we need to be mindful of. The other, just two very quick points, hopefully, um, about how we begin to uh, achieve dignity and respect, how we make those those principles real. Um, we've talked about automatic entitlements. I think that is one way um, to to make real that that those um, those principles of dignity and respect. Um, uh, there's, there's been some work done um, by by DWP to look at um, to look at automatic entitlements. Paul Spicker has has made some references to it in some of his uh, draft uh, response to the to Social Security Bill. Uh, Paul has said that you know that it's 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 not straightforward, but there there's certainly potential to look at how we can introduce more automatic entitlements. I think the other aspect of that is data and how we better use data within our system to ensure that people have uh, entitlements. Glasgow City Council 
it's, it's small, it's small probably compared to what we're discussing here, but making better use of data to ensure that people who are entitled to school clothing grants get them and don't need to apply to, for them. So how can we use data more creatively um, in, the, in the operations of our new system to, um, to better deliver benefits to people automatically? And finally, um, again, picking up on the points around co-production, um, and, and Bill's points very forcefully at the end there around genuine involvement, that's how you achieve dignity and respect, by involving people who, who have first-hand knowledge um, of the, the problems in the system. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean slowing everything down. That does, we do need to take our time, we do need to get things right, but we do also need to have a sense of urgency about this as well that, uh, again, Bill has, has put very forcefully. Thank you very much. Craig, yeah, and then Isla. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on a comment made by um, Alison and George. Um, it feeds into the idea of dignity and respect. Um, obviously, speaking to, to the service users directly is, is hugely important, but I think the role of third sector organisations as facilitators of that um, shouldn't be overlooked. Quite often, bringing people directly into a situation like this or speaking to, to people in the civil service or in government can be quite intimidating. Um, and I think allowing people a space to speak openly and uh, without fear um, is important to get the, the best evidence. Uh, and I think using the third sector as that sort of channel is, is an important thing. Um, that ties into co-production, and this is where the dignity and respect should hopefully come from, by speaking to these people directly and finding out their experiences of the existing systems and what they would like to see um, changed. Um, but moving away from just the policy of, of social security, there's also the delivery of the system on the ground and um, ensuring that the staff uh, who will ultimately deliver these systems are made well aware of people's needs and, and treat them with um, you know, empathy instead of with suspicion um, is very important. Um, also, I would say that the, it's important to recognise that no system is completely flawless, um, and despite your best efforts to, to make sure that the system's um, perfect, there will be errors, there always are. Um, and for people who do come up against those, there should be uh, adequate provision of advocacy, it should be encouraged, it should be accepted that there will be faults somewhere along the line, and that that should always be open to people and they should be made aware of it. Um, and finally, just as a final point, if, if it's important for everyone that dignity and respect is in the system, there should perhaps be some way of measuring whether that has been achieved. Um, and you may want to look at how that could be measured and where it should be benchmarked from. Thank you very much for giving us another task from the, there as well. Then. Um, Isla and then Leila. Um, and, and thanks to George as well for picking up on the, the power of the, the genuine co-production could have an influence in um, a, a system um, that delivers dignity and respect for people and everyone else for, for underlining that. Um, I, I think it's worth um, perhaps uh, sharing with the committee some of the some of the comments that were made by um, 400 GDA members who, who gathered to, to speak with Jean Freeman and actually the, 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 the warmth and the sort of proactive feeling that was in the room has been commented on by many of our members that it, it, it's the engagement process to this point has seemed very has seemed a lot more genuine than often um, people have experienced and um, that w people are very very keen um, in answer to, to your question uh, question Pauline um, to, to see um, values of co-production embedded in the social security bill would be um would be a really good start to continue this through um in terms of um implementing dignity and respect um people who responded uh, to the the conference that we were having um spoke about being made to feel like they were begging um the the process is been dehumanising. Many, many, many people um, spoke about uh, being treated as if they're at it and that this is the default within the current system. Um, the, the people felt that the forums are set up to try and trick you and to try and trip you up. Um, uh, people have been described as lazy and um, treated and feel that they're treated as if they're not normal um, when they're claiming um, their entitlements. Um, and another factor being that people um, 
found it quite rare to be given straightforward and clear information about what they were entitled to. They felt that it's, a, it's, it's almost like a mystery that you have to try and puzzle out and unlock um, for yourself, especially when you don't have, if you, if you are lacking access to support um, uh, to go through that process. Um, and um, I think that um, involving disabled people and people who are um, in, entitled to social security in the whole process, including design and, and oversight and scrutiny um, as well, is, um, is, a, is a way to, to monitor whether that's um, changing. Um, and an, an, another key thing that, um, that came up in almost every one of the tables that that we were um, discussing at um, was that the system needs to be made more accessible, that forms need to be streamlined and made much more accessible and straightforward. Um, and as Bill was saying, that the, the old DLA forms, um, it seems that they've become a lot more complicated than that and um, that that is a real barrier to people um, getting what they're entitled to. Um, and also on the lines of uh, dignity and respect and, um, and looking at um, possible ways to use the top, topping up powers as well. Um, other factors such as um, uh, social care, um, the, the, the charges that people can face for social care. Um, they could be receiving everything that they're entitled to and then have everything in their, everything beyond housing costs removed from them if they choose to have social care if they, that, they, that they need and they're given that we, we've, got, we've got many, many GDA members who um, can't afford to pay for the care that they need so they can't basically live their lives, they can't do anything um, or go anywhere or contribute in any of the ways that they could be contributing in because the rate that they're, um, they're taxed at essentially for their social care needs can be up to 100% of your um, disposable income um, and when you're living on the poverty line or under the poverty line already, um, that is a, a real systematic problem in, uh, in, in, in our whole system to tackling poverty. Um, so that's one thing. I know that it's the, the bill to um, uh, look at abolishing the, um, the community care charges um, uh, is, is, is being considered. So we, that's something that we very, very, very strongly support um, as, as a um, as a massive hurdle. And the, obviously we've got to wrap this session up at 11 o'clock at the latest, because we obviously we have other business to get through, then we have to be in the chamber. Uh, some members have uh, questions as well. So, Leila, yeah. did you want to come in? I'll try, I'll try and be brief. It was just to respond to a few brief things. So, George's point about getting it right, I'm, I just wanted to respond to that, because in including it in our written submission, I thought it was really interesting and reassuring that people who are on benefit, disability benefits, and also working within the welfare rights system, there is a sense of urgency and we do want to change it. But that I think that point of getting it right and understanding what is possible with the powers that have been devolved and what has been reserved and always managing expectations as well within that is something that I think a few people have said, but I think is important. Um, and just acknowledging that people have been quite pragmatic in a way, acknowledging that there it is a complicated system but want to be part of that, and co-production is really important. I would add to co-production and involvement of disabled people, though, I think it'd be really interesting to get in input from people who work on welfare rights um, and advice services, because they, they have a similar perspective, but they're working within that system and sometimes know how they've managed to make things possible. Um, and related to that is that point that Isla just raised and I was going to mention, something that's come up time and again anecdotally and when we've been doing focus groups is the tra lack of transparency in the system, that people are having to ask certain questions or to know what questions to ask or to be feisty or to have support. And actually it means that the most vulnerable drop through because it's just not clear what is available um, and that expectation that you've got to kind of fight for it um, isn't necessarily fair for those most vulnerable people. Um, and then lastly, a very couple of quick points, um, just because I don't think they've come up yet, is Bill was talking about the potential for having one benefit, and we've also been looking at that, and the, there would be potential benefits for having one benefit in simplicity. If, even if there wasn't one benefit through life instead of the three that there are now, it would be worth looking at changing the ages, or at least considering that, particularly for young adults. So people who are moving out of education, um, it can come at a time where they're moving benefits, where there might also be changes at home, changes at school, college, 
um, that can really impact and make it particularly difficult for people is what we're hearing. Um, and then lastly, related to all of this, whatever system is brought in, not everyone's going to get on a certain benefit. They're not, going to, they're not going to. And certainly various people have said to us, that's okay. If it's transparent and they understand why and there isn't an, an appeal process where most appeals go through, they can, they can see that. They just didn't qualify. Um, and for those people, maybe signposting and improved advice or linking in with other services like the Welfare Fund, Independent Living Fund or other support where possible would really help. Thank you very much. Ben, you wanted to come in and then Pauline. Do you want to yeah, thank you, convener. Oh, the, uh, it's around the, the thematic point about creating a system based on dignity and respect, I thought Craig Wilson from SCBO put it very well. We, our ambition and our, our collective ambition should be to, to create a system where we treat others with empathy and, and not with suspicion. And just in general terms around processes that we could improve, comment on sanctions and assessments, I know some's been made already, but whether it's disability benefits around universal credit or ESE and GSE, the, the, the reserved powers that are remaining reserved, I just wondered within that context if any of you could elaborate more on, on how we, we do create a system where we, we treat others with empathy and not suspicion at, at frontline delivery in terms of uh, where the services are accessed but also uh, around um, the processes that we, we can improve. Did you want to reply to that, Leila, in two quick seconds? <laughs> yes, OK. Really briefly, I think some of it is about training and people having the right amount of training for different groups. So frontline staff being, whether that, I mean, it might not necessarily be ATOS, but people having the right training to do the job, to assess people, or if they're working with people to advise them on benefits, understanding different particular groups, and maybe streamlining, um, for, for instance, are they getting? Are they aware of the right com support or disability? Would be part of it. Mark, you wanted to come in, and then Marion, and then George, and then Pauline. Thanks, Kavira. It was a question um, for members of the panel about sanctions. Um, sanctions seem to be to hit people particularly hard in, in any of the food banks that I visited. Um, those have been the two big issues of why people are visiting food banks. Either they've had their benefits cut or removed, or they've been sanctioned. And they've got no means to, to heat their homes or put food on the table for their families. And the, the government um, recently have made some comments in the press about um, engaging in um, non-compliance with DWP and not telling the DWP um, if a particular claimant has not attended a, a work programme or, or anything like that. Just to ask people around the table what they feel about the sanction system as it is, whether a, a non-compliance approach from the Scottish Government could work to alleviate that or whether there's a different way of working, perhaps a, a cleaner way, um, to make sure that um, people aren't being sanctioned and really taking away their ability to feed their, their kids. Thank, thank you very much, Mark. Marion wanted in, and then it was George, and then it was Pauline, and then anybody else after that. Um, well, firstly, just to very much echo <coughs> the issues around sort of stigma and judgmental attitudes. Um, when we surveyed um, single parents, we were, we were quite shocked that over 80% felt that they had um, felt stigma and had been judged, and some of that would be about the myths around being a single parent, that they're all young single parents, whereas, in fact, the average age is sort of 36. But... What was um, more shocking was that in terms of dealing with Job Centre Plus, 60 odd percent felt that there was a judgmental attitude towards them. And I think sort of some of the backdrop to that is, is pretty much around the very work first approach now to social security and the recognition that, that um, you know, parents maybe don't get the recognition they, the, in terms of bringing up their children or volunteers don't get the recognition of the contribution they make to the community. So. I think some of that is around attitudes in relation to what um, Social Security is all about. Um, secondly, around conditionality. Single parents have been sort of very negatively affected by, by conditionality um, on various fronts, not only losing benefit, but um, as an impact on behaviour. We've just sort of done a study around you know, parents moving into work that's not appropriate, um, the impact on family wellbeing, mental health, um, sustainable employment, you know, kind of very, very negative. Um, and uh, so we would very much welcome um, that when 
powers come around uh, what was the work programme, that um, conditionality is not part of that. It is not found to have been successful um, and shouldn't be part of any system that we're involved in that we reduce uh, parents with children to have to go to food banks because they've been, been sanctioned. Um, very much support um, funding towards child benefit, universal benefit, high take-up. Um, it's available at times of crisis um, when other benefits haven't came through, when there's no money that you expect to have came in, child benefit is, is, always, is always there. Um, I very much support CPAG's um, research around that. Um, we haven't touched on universal credit and split payments, um, and uh, we, I know it came up at the last meeting, so not to go into a lot of detail, but very much uh, kind of supporting uh, the committee to look at that. Um, we did a, an insight workshop for Scottish Government with single parents, and they talked about you know, what had happened before they split up with their partner and how the fact that if the money was in the control of, 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 um, you know, kind of uh, their partner, the impact that would have on their family life, um, the well-being of their children would be pretty uh, drastic. And we were very kind of taken with that. The majority of parents that they were, they were, you know, it was very worrying. And in fact, they kind of said it would actually put them off going into another relationship. You know, so if you've got single parents who've had a bad experience and then discover that if they meet someone, uh, that uh, this whole thing's going to, you know, it's housing benefits, the whole lot, um, uh, and they find themselves in another controlling situation, it would, would be a bit off-putting. So, um, but yeah, just I think our new system, we have to um, learn the lessons and I think the welfare fund as well in terms of how that's worked and there's been some issues around how that's been delivered and, you know, staff on our, uh, or whoever is working in the new agency, training is going to be crucial and, you know, kind of, um, you know, sort of uh, Poverty Alliance have done training as well, you know, kind of for staff about uh, poverty awareness and I think that's really important that we have a system that's not got a sort of blame culture, that there's, you know, there's, there's a more um, positive and um, involvement um, from people receiving benefit as well. Um, not just engagement, as Bill has said, it's actual, you know, within the structure that there's an entitlement. Thank you very much, Marion. John, you wanted to come in on that quick point then. George, you wanted to come in. Yeah, it's a kind of elephant in the room this morning has been how you pay for all these different improvements that people want to see uh, and the benefits that are being devolved. I mean, take, for example, the, the social fund funeral payment, which is causing a crisis amongst people on low incomes and forcing them into debt and poverty. And uh, only £4 million pounds has been transferred from the Westminster budget to the Scottish uh, Parliament's budget. And how can that £4 million pounds make a vast improvement? It can't. So I think there has to be a public debate and people have got to be honest and open that if you want to see improved benefits, if you want to see a better system, it's going to cost money. And if it's going to cost money, where is the Scottish Government going to get the money from? And there has to be a debate around the low tax culture that has haunted politics in this country for generations now. If people don't want to pay tax, they can't expect to get a wonderful welfare system. That's the bottom line. And it's time that politicians address that publicly so that people can be told, yes, we'll give you this, that and the other, but we're not putting your tax up. It doesn't work that way. And I think we've got to change that culture if we want to see real improvements in the system. Thank you, John. George. I'm glad John came in at that point, because I was going to ask uh, one of the questions that, uh, that comes up regularly. I was in the committee the last time, in the local government committee, when we looked at funeral payments and funeral poverty with one of the bills towards the end of the last uh, session. And one thing we can all agree, regardless of our background, regardless of our finances, life is all going in one direction. And uh, we're all going to have the same kind of end at the end of the day. And one of the things I'd like to ask is, uh, you know, this is, we found when we were doing that, ev uh, taking evidence from the local authorities, the, the cost and funeral payments were dramatic. You know, effectively, if I look at my own constituency, you know, uh, from Paisley and across the water in some of the Dumbarton shires, it was phenomenal. And you were just going across a bridge. You know, you were, all, you were almost, a, well, you weren't a stone's throw away, but you were close communities. And effectively, the cost and funeral payments were uh, phenomenal. Now, uh, one of the things is it wasn't really addressed at the bill the last time, but how would we look at that uh, in, as we go forward? Because I think this is one of the, as I said, we're all heading in that uh, direction, but it's something that affects everyone and is 
or an older, uh, or an elderly population, it's something that's one of these things that, uh, because of poverty in general, uh, the, we have older people who aren't like they did previously, ensuring that they have cover for their, uh, uh, their funeral costs. But the thing is, it's so different in whatever area. So, you know, I, do you have any ideas how we could go forward with this or what we could do? Or has there been any discussions within the uh, pensioners' forums as to what the way forward? Yeah, well, I think there's the... Uh, obviously, there's the, the Scottish Government's own working party on funeral poverty has looked at this in depth and they've come up with some ideas. One of the suggestions they're making is that you, uh, there has to be a licensing system for funeral directors and therefore the Scottish Government can impose a code of conduct mm -hmm. uh, as a condition of this licensing system. And, that would, and part of that would be to be transparent about costs and to bring them down. And local authorities and private, uh, private providers of crematoria. In Dundee, we've got one crematorium owned by Dignity PLC, and it happens to be one of the most expensive places in Scotland. That's because there's no competition. <coughs> Dignity PLC can do what they like in Dundee, can charge whatever they like. Now that kind of, you've got to address those systems. It has to be done through licensing and through a code of conduct that everybody involved in the funeral industry has to abide by. And you could perhaps get a basic, simple state funeral, which is funded through welfare payments for those who can't afford it. And, uh, and cuts out all the kind of extras that get, that get pushed onto people at a time when they can't make decisions because they're in crisis and they're, they're depressed and so on. I think the working party goes a long way to addressing it, but the working party's long-term solutions, a funeral bond and so on, will take a long time to, to put in place. And in the interim, people will continue to be in crisis and continue to be forced into debt to bury their beloveds, their, their, their family. And that short term has to be some kind of cover found for them during that period as well. Thank you. Pauline, be very patient, Pauline. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad uh, George Adam and John McAllen have raised this issue. It's become recently very topical, and I, I, I agree that there's a sense of urgency about getting a solution, perhaps uh, some we could discuss at a later date, but perhaps also follow on from what John McAllen said about all the asks. I want just want to be clear in my head about some things here. I, mean, I, I asked the question about what level of prescription, therefore, is required in this forthcoming bill. It seems to me that there needs to be a fairly high level of prescription, is my initial thoughts. And I agree that the only way I suppose we could work our way through that is to work very closely with the third sector in that. Because if we have to achieve the principles of dignity and things like accessibility for free phone lines being, I think, an important aspect of that, an appeal system, which is a better appeal system than the one that we have. Um, advocacy, ways to measure whether or not we've achieved all of that and some level of automation in the system, I would have thought it has to be in the bill to some degree, or we need to know what the relationship between the bill and the design of the system. So I think that it needs to be a lot of work. I'd certainly like to discuss this in some level of detail. But I also, um, I suppose, in my own mind, want to be clear about all the asks, which John referred to. Um, the, so we have the power to top up benefits, and that's good, but I'd just like to audit a little bit if exactly you want to add up all the asks so we can have a look and have a discussion about what that looks like, because obviously there are limitations to, to what we can achieve. And just lastly, convener, um, Bill Scott mentioned, and I think it was also mentioned by Leela, that there are opportunities to merge benefits I think it would be helpful, I think, for the committee um, to have some information on if there's cost savings to be achieved from that, that I think that would be important to offset against um, the power to top up would be quite important. So I'd certainly like to see that evidence, because it kind of makes sense. You reduce the administration costs um, by merging one benefit, but we need to see whether that's a cost saving or whether that's actually an, an additional cost. So. I'd be interested if that could be some follow-up on that. Thank you very much. I, I'm sorry I've not got time for any more questions. And Mark's question about sanctions, obviously we can, we can talk about that uh, either in the later sessions or uh, in the, the work programme. Uh, we are looking to get the consultation results back. It'll be the end of this year. And a number of the issues that's been raised, and I know that you know, I, I attended some of these sessions, will certainly be not answered as such, but we'll have evidence of the people who actually are on the ground there who are receiving you know, social security benefits, whatever, we'll get that feedback and we can work from there. And it's just trying to collate it all together. Uh, obviously, I think sanctions is a huge, big issue from it. I also think we haven't touched on 
in work poverty. I think that's an area where we need to look at as well. Uh, how do disabled people, people who are uh, in work with very low pay, how do they actually, uh, you know, have meetings with, you know, Social Security or, or various other agencies? There's lots and lots to see, but I must admit it's been a very, very interesting uh, discussion. I think we've perhaps, I don't know if we've learned a lot, we've certainly had a lot more questions anyway, uh, and we'll certainly be looking at that as well. But thank you all very, very much, and uh, thanks very much for your contributions. Uh, we'll now go into private session. <laughs>